A wise man once asked, who watches The Watchmen? Well, the same goes for critics. From classic parodies to beloved sequels, here are movies that Rotten Tomatoes critics were totally wrong about. Nicolas Cage loves to act. It's as simple as that. He pours every ounce of his soul into his roles, no matter what caliber of script is tossed onto his desk. Whether it be an Oscar-winning performance in the existential heartbreaker leaving Las Vegas, or a zany turn as a literary agent who believes he's becoming a vampire in the black comedy Vampire's Kiss. I'm a vampire! 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 And don't forget big budget blockbusters with over the top plots like 2004's National Treasure. He definitely goes all in on these ventures too, and that's the main reason this one is worth your time. The film follows Ben, a noted historian and treasure hunter who sets out to discover a hidden secret at the heart of the United States. It also involves a healthy dose of conspiracy, as both the Templars and the Freemasons have roles to play, while a certain super important American document is a central part of the plot. I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. It's these sillier elements that ensure National Treasure was never going to be a critical darling, as the story is way too outlandish. In fact, most reviews commented on the unbelievable narrative as a major negative, but it's also the kind of wacky fun that makes for great escapism in a similar way to Night at the Museum or The Mummy. And though the plot is unbelievable, that doesn't mean the script itself is bad. In fact, structurally speaking, it's very well put together. Throw in a stellar cast that includes Diane Kruger, John Voight, Sean Bean, and Harvey Keitel, and National Treasure is a great way to spend a couple of hours, especially if you go into it not expecting to have to think too hard about what's actually going on. Based on the Chris Van Allsburg novel of the same name, Jumanji met with a mixed reception when it hit cinema screens in 1995. That might be surprising to some people, as the movie is often regarded as a classic of the 1990s, and the franchise has continued to grow with two recent sequels, starring the likes of Dwayne Johnson and Jack Black. The original story finds Robin Williams caught up in a mystical board game, which brings hazards from the jungle world into real life. Run! It's a stampede! In many ways, Jumanji is the ultimate comfort movie. Its dated special effects are more charming than disruptive, and Robin Williams gives an on-brand, touching performance that makes us all miss him just as much as some of his higher-rated films do. God bless you. In fact, everyone in Jumanji adds to the magic of the film, from Jonathan Hyde to David Alan Greer and a young Kirsten Dunst. Throw in a great musical score and a script with solid pacing, and you've got yourself one of those movies you can turn on any time you feel the urge to unplug from our current dystopia and remember simpler times and better movies. Sequels are a dangerous game, especially when the original is way better than it has the right to be. Capturing that magic twice is unlikely, and this is certainly the case with 2001's The Mummy Returns. What'd you do this time? Well, I, I haven't done anything to anybody! However, just because it pales in comparison to the original doesn't mean it deserves to be excluded from your DVD collection. Here's how. Sure, it certainly has some pretty clunky dialogue and isn't nearly as memorable as the first installment, aside from one particularly stellar action sequence. Oh, I hate mummies. A lot of people will also remember the awful CGI for Dwayne Johnson's Scorpion King character, but let's get real for a second. Sometimes bad special effects age like fine wine and make us laugh and reminisce rather than scoff. This is definitely the case with The Rock's computer-generated appearance, and in the end, it's infinitely more enduring than similar scenes of the same technical caliber that pop up in other less-than-stellar sequels to beloved franchise favorites. And don't forget about the genuine chemistry between Brendan Fraser's Rick O'Connell and Rachel Weisz's Evelyn Carnahan, something that's sorely missing from so many modern blockbusters. Take these sentiments into account, and The Mummy Returns is actually a hell of a lot of fun. Looking back on Jim Carrey's career now, it's fair to say that The Cable Guy doesn't stand out as a strange entry in his extensive filmography. He's played a wide variety of characters in a wide variety of movies, from absolute buffoons like Lloyd in Dumb and Dumber, to the sensitive and flawed Joel in the Oscar-winning 2004 masterpiece Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Why do I fall in love with every woman I see who shows me the least bit of attention? However, context is important. Transport yourself back to 1996, and imagine experiencing Carrie's role as Chip Douglas, and not having much to compare it to besides movies like Ace Ventura, The Mask, or the cringe-tastic Batman Forever. 
Besides criticizing the heavy-handed observations about Gen X's obsession with television, this is what critics and fans alike fixated on at the time of its release. People just weren't ready to see Jim Carrey be anything other than a lovable goofball. Granted, he's still plenty of a goofball in the film, but the silliness of his character is often overshadowed by the darkness that drives his increasingly disturbing behavior. And ultimately, it's this characterization of the frightening yet bizarrely likable Chip that allows Carrey's talents to shine through and create a truly memorable performance that helps earn the movie a place on this list. On top of that, the film is filled with iconically hilarious moments that would make anybody laugh and plenty of well-placed pop culture references, including a Star Trek-inspired fight scene complete with medieval armor. The name is Spock. If we don't battle to the death, they will kill us both. Parodies are some of the hardest types of comedy to get right, and they often aren't appreciated in their own time. Spaceballs found that out firsthand when it was released in 1987. Meant to be a spoof of the original Star Wars trilogy and various other sci-fi series, the Mel Brooks movie failed to impress critics. It also failed to inspire audiences at the box office, just about making back its budget with takings of $38 million. However, in the intervening years, Spaceballs has become a cult classic and a comedy favorite, as well as being arguably Mel Brooks' most popular release. It contains a wide array of excellent sight gags, including the sandy desert being combed and quotes that will never expire. Sir, we've never gone that fast before. I don't know if the ship can take us. What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? Chicken? In terms of casting, the infectious chemistry between Bill Pullman and John Candy gives the film a heartwarming sense of camaraderie. And of course, Rick Moranis puts in one of the best performances of his career as the comical Dark Helmet. The ring! I can't believe you fell for the oldest trick in the book! What a goof! Critics weren't all that fond of Taken when it was first released back in 2008. The Liam Neeson action film sees a former Special Forces soldier embark on a mission to locate his missing daughter and her friend after they're kidnapped by traffickers while vacationing in France. I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. Like many thrillers, Taken doesn't focus on the overarching narrative as much as it does the action. The plot is simple and ultimately unlikely. Some also criticize the acting in the film, but it's obvious that the filmmakers weren't pining for an award at the Cannes Film Festival. It doesn't pretend to be something it's not, and that's what so many critics and regular moviegoers alike get wrong when they're cooking up their hot takes. We should be thankful when action movies aren't riddled with half-baked political messages or pseudo-intellectual musings that stifle the pacing. Sometimes Sometimes it's perfectly acceptable to just sit back, eat too much popcorn, and let Liam Neeson be a badass for an hour and a half. There are only a few films that successfully blend live action and animation in a satisfying way. Most would agree that Who Framed Roger Rabbit is the prime example of a movie where they actually managed to nail this difficult blend. Space Jam is undoubtedly another instance, even if it didn't resonate with critics when it arrived in cinemas in 1996. The film features Michael Jordan and the cast of the Looney Tunes in a tale where they must defeat a team of aliens who intend on enslaving them and using them as attractions for their amusement park, Moron Mountain, in a game of basketball. Basketball. You heard of the dream team? Well, we're the mean team, wussy man. Wussy man. Yeah, it's a silly plot and the acting is atrocious, but that's not what matters. It's Jordan's genial nature and energy that give the movie a lighthearted authenticity that transcends space and time. Seeing all of our favorite cartoon characters come to life in the real world, alongside possibly the most beloved sports star of all time, will always be enduring, no matter what decade we find ourselves in. Equilibrium has one of the biggest gaps in audience and critic scores on Rotten Tomatoes, with its poor review ratings in direct opposition to the high marks given by viewers. Many reviews were scathing, suggesting it was derivative and void of any originality. If you've only seen trailers for the 2002 film, no one would blame you for agreeing with them. Watching a black trench coat wearing Christian Bale bust through doors with a pistol in each hand and use martial arts to dominate anyone who stands in his way in a bleak dystopian future? It sure looks a lot like another much more critically acclaimed movie that came out a few years prior. I don't believe it. 
However, if you watch the movie in its entirety, you'll realize how different it actually is under the surface. In a world scarred by a nuclear World War III, the human population in Libria is kept under control by a totalitarian government and a drug that suppresses emotion. Christian Bale portrays Preston, a cleric tasked with executing those who dare to feel. He slowly begins to rebel against the government as the film progresses, and his journey from hardline enforcer to revolutionary is a joy to see unfold. I'm coming. Coming two years after the incredibly successful Home Alone was released, Home Alone 2 Lost in New York was an inevitable sequel. Although its predecessor was not a massive hit with critics, it made so much money at the box office that it was obvious a second film would come. The sequel fared even worse, with reviews disparaging the way it was apparently completely derivative of the original 1990 movie. They're not wrong, it really does recycle pretty much every component. Kevin ends up on his own, he uses his resourcefulness to thwart Harry and Marv, he's reminded of the true meaning of Christmas by being forced to interact with a scary stranger who ends up being one of the sweetest people ever. But consider this, there's something to be said about sequels that bring back every actor from the original film. In fact, the entire creative team, including director Chris Columbus and writer John Hughes, all returned for the movie. This makes it feel like a believable, heartfelt continuation, not just a brainless cash grab initiated by indifferent producers. And besides all that, who can deny that it never gets old watching Harry and Marv face off against elaborate booby traps that are quite a bit more catastrophic and demented than those in the original? <laughs> It might be hard to find people who are willing to admit they don't like Hook, but that wasn't always the case. What's now considered a classic adventure film for the whole family was once lambasted by critics and seen as something of a financial failure despite bringing in more than $300 million at the box office. Even director Steven Spielberg has expressed his disappointment with the film. <laughs> Most of the criticism was concentrated on the lack of original ideas to differentiate this from a standard retelling of the Peter Pan story. Others were of the opinion that the plot was weak, arguing that the script drags a bit in the middle. Even if you agree with those criticisms, there's still so much to like about Hook, especially the acting. Robin Williams lends his enduring passion to the character of Peter, cultivating a very human version of him that elevates what could have easily been a flaccid, two-dimensional performance in a lesser actor's hands. The same can be said for Dustin Hoffman, whose cap and Hook is simultaneously likable and memorably villainous. And who didn't believe I could do it? Who doubted me? Julia Roberts shines, both literally and figuratively, as Tinkerbell. You are embarrassing me! Even Glenn Close has an unlikely and uncredited cameo as the unfortunate pirate who ends up in the dreaded Boo Box. The Boo Box. <laughs> no, 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 the Boo Box. No! no! Beyond the performances, the film looks great on a technical level, with impressive sets and special effects. Everything from Captain Hook's ship to the Lost Boy's colorful, imaginary feast is a cinematic sight to behold. John Williams' score is also often considered to be some of his best work as well. The Mighty Ducks was never likely to be the type of film that would go down well with critics. It's a feel-good story that features every trope you'd expect from a sports film. Whether it's the underdog team or the down-on-his-luck reluctant coach, this 1992 comedy drama does little on the way of innovating the genre. But so what? That's a weak reason to discard a movie, especially one that's meant primarily for kids. They aren't sitting down with their families to search for evidence that the filmmakers are being derivative or lazy. They aren't analyzing character arcs or story beats. They're laughing at Goldberg when he farts in the limo. Goldberg! Oh, it right? They're laughing at the players as they struggle to pass eggs back and forth to each other on the ice. They're rooting for Charlie as he takes the same game-deciding penalty shot that coach Gordon Bombay missed when he was a kid. They're vicariously experiencing a meaningful victory that comes as the result of good sportsmanship and dedication. These are the types of movies kids should be enjoying when they're still a ways off from adulthood. Ultimately, the critical response to The Mighty Ducks is an example of reviewers not considering the intended audience. The script is competent, the characters are memorable, and it's as rewatchable as any other classic of the genre. And it's obvious that a whole bunch of people really enjoyed it at the time and still do, as the franchise has since expanded into multiple movies, a television series on Disney+, and even a real-life NHL hockey team. 
Comedy films often face a tough time with critics and very rarely get universal acclaim when they're released. Even some of the best comedies don't make an impression with reviewers despite being hugely popular with audiences. Step Brothers is a great example of this. It missed out on a fresh rating, even though it's widely considered to be one of the best comedy movies of the last two decades. The plot revolves around two 40-year-old men, Brennan and Dale, who still live at home and are forced to coexist with each other after their respective single parents get married. Increasing levels of hilarity and debauchery ensue, with Will Ferrell and John C. Riley's characters showcasing legendary acts of immaturity as they try to drive each other out of the house. They eventually become inseparable, but their outlandishly childish natures remain for the majority of the film. It's hilarious, touching, and endlessly quotable. If you were a chick, who's the one guy you would sleep with? John Samos. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Famed film critic Roger Ebert was not amused by the movie whatsoever, giving it one out of five stars and writing, When did comedies get so mean? Step Brothers has a premise that might have produced a good time at the movies, but when I left, I felt a little unclean. Of course, this is coming from a guy who thought that the only funny part of Dumb and Dumber was the blind kid being given a dead parakeet. It's difficult to see what's not to like about Reign of Fire. It features a post-apocalyptic modern world where dragons have awoken from millions of years of hibernation to wipe out almost all of humanity. With civilization collapsed, due in part to humanity's poor decision to use nuclear weapons to try and eliminate the dragons, hope is pinned on the few survivors scattered across the planet. They plot to kill the dragon leader and save themselves from certain extinction. And if you don't think that sounds rad, you're lying to yourself. The movie ended as a critical and commercial failure, grossing just $80 million against a budget of $60 million. Even its audience score sits at a rather low 49%. However, those willing to give this science fantasy film a chance might be pleasantly surprised. The world of the film is fully realized and believable, its grittiness almost tangible. Christian Bale's Quinn and Matthew McConaughey's Denton are both compelling characters with conflicting ideologies that build a convincing tension throughout its 102-minute runtime. And honestly, the CGI dragons actually look pretty amazing considering how aged the movie is. Even more amazing is the fact that the CGI isn't overused, which is something to be celebrated in and of itself. Ask any fan of Die Hard to rank every film in the series, and Die Hard with a Vengeance is unlikely to be anywhere near the bottom. In fact, the general consensus puts the third film right at the top of the pile, beaten out only by the original 1988 movie. Welcome to the party, pal! Yet, it's one of the worst reviewed entries of the franchise. In many ways, this third film is completely different than what came before it. John McClane has seen a dramatic fall from grace, kicked off the police force. He's now living a disgraced life as an alcoholic. It's almost like he's just the washed up shell of who he might have been if he'd never won Hollyback and bested Hans Gruber at the top of Nakatomi Plaza, or thwarted the renegade soldiers at Dulles International Airport. All in all, though, these changes work out in the end. The banter and chemistry between Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson is second to none and results in some perfect comedy moments. Are you aiming for these people? No. Maybe that mine. Jeremy Irons' villainous character Simon is another highlight, as is the bizarre Simon Says game he plays that has McLean going all over New York to stop bombs from exploding in the city. We eventually learn that Simon is Hans Gruber's brother, which creates a legitimate connection to the first film and subverts the previous trope that McLean is just a coincidental hero who continually happens to be in the right place at the right time. Unlike typical Disney princess movies that are fully animated, The Princess Diaries is a coming-of-age comedy that is entirely live-action. Featuring the talents of Anne Hathaway and Julie Andrews, it's based on Meg Cabot's novel of the same name and follows a young girl living in the U.S. who suddenly discovers that she is the heir to a European kingdom. Me? A... a princess? Shut! Tutored in how to act as a royal by her grandmother, she must ultimately decide whether she wants to become a queen or renounce the throne. Critics were initially underwhelmed with the 2001 film, feeling it was lacking in story and trying to be too many things at once. But there's a good selection of genuinely funny moments and the film is constantly endearing, with standout performances from both Andrews and Hathaway. The film never comes across as overly preachy either. Yeah, it's full of moral lessons, but it doesn't shove them in your face, letting them come out naturally as the action unfolds. As a clean and harmless film, it makes great family viewing and serves as yet another example of a movie that you can just turn on and enjoy even if it's already half over.